walks with God Can he walk anywhere? Hello everyone, my name is Felipe Andres Coronel, everyone calls me Immortal Technique, Tech, hey you, <laughs> sign this for me, uh, maybe I should begin at the beginning. I was born in the Hospital Militar de Lima in South America and Peru, um, I came to this country when I was about two or three years old because of the severe violence and economic downturn of America. And my father thought it'd be a great idea to find peace in uh, Harlem in the 80s. <laughs> you can imagine the uh, interesting experience growing up. But I grew up surrounded by culture. As much as I grew up surrounded by violence and difficulty, I grew up in the mecca of hip hop. I grew up where Street musicians played whatever type of music they wanted to on the street, whether it was rock or jazz or reggae or hip hop, especially during that era. I grew up in a time in which there was more police corruption than you could ever possibly imagine in a city that seemed almost lawless. When you go down to 42nd Street now in New York City, it looks like Disneyland. I remember when it was full of pimps and prostitutes and thieves and card sharks. And from that experience, I grew to have a very aggressive nature. Because in New York, it didn't matter if you went to a good school or a bad school, you were going to encounter some kind of conflict or confrontation sometime in your life. I think that I took some positive aspects from this and I took some very negative aspects from this. One of the negative aspects I took was sometimes the need to feel like I needed to validate myself through that confrontation and violence. Um, it wasn't until I realized that life is going to put you through so many things that you don't need to put yourself through them to prove anything to anybody. So if someone feels like they haven't gone through enough in life to feel like they can justify their position to anybody else, wait a couple of years. You'll be surprised. Um, I graduated from high school and I attended Penn State University, although I was never part of their football program. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny and sad at the same time. Um, but I, I discovered culture shock when I went to university. You know, because when I arrived, they didn't understand the concept of a Peruvian much less a person of Afro-Peruvian descent or someone who's Peruvian and black or a Latino that was actually proud of having black ancestry. They thought that they were only Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, and that was it. Um, I saw a different type of racism, one that may have not come with a white hood and a burning cross, but definitely permeated the atmosphere of complete and cultural ignorance. I saw people that were suffering from the same conditions that we were in a ghetto in New York City in a low income, primarily white neighborhood in Pennsylvania. It opened my eyes to realizing a lot of class issues that superseded racial issues and that were sometimes using racial issues to hide the class issue. Um, I, could always make music. I played jazz guitar, I'm sorry, jazz trumpet for about four or five years. And I never really started rapping or taking it seriously until after I was incarcerated. I was incarcerated because I would get into fights nonstop with people. And when I say nonstop, I will be honest right now and say that sometimes I would just look for reasons to get into fights. And ironically enough, for those times that I was incarcerated, I wasn't looking for a fight that night. I happened to surround myself with so much negativity and so much of, a, of a, a nasty attitude and a disposition towards other people that eventually I think that that just found me somehow. I ended up incarcerated for about a year of time. And during that period, I did a lot of self-reflection. 
I took a lot of personal responsibility for the things that I had done wrong in my life. And I realized that similar to the way that the people who create the world's problems aren't going to fix them for the benefit of anybody, that I couldn't depend on looking through history books at the people that had done wrong to my people who didn't even exist anymore and expect them to fix my problems, that I had to fix them for their own. But that it was important to unwind the riddle and the mythology of America to get to the reality and the truth of what this country is founded on and to what it should represent to the people in the future. I think this is important to everybody in this room because whether you choose to accept your fate or not, whether you choose to acknowledge it or not, you will, you are the next generation of America. You will raise the next generation of Americans. You will be the future of this country. That is not a fate that you can run away from. Similar to the Bible story in Jonah, where he hears the voice of God say, you must preach the word, and he ignores it. You can't run away from that destiny. It will find you. You can choose to accept it now at a point in your life where you're very young, and you have enough time and enough leverage in an institution like this to educate yourself to what you would like to make a difference in this country about. Or you can choose to ignore that and come to terms with that later on in life where you have left less opportunities, where you have less leverage, where you have more responsibilities that are family oriented that will take a precedence over you having the opportunity to educate yourself to the fullest extent that you can. It doesn't mean that you'll make less of a difference. It just means that you have the potential to make more now and to learn more. I remember that the most important thing about school is that it gives you the ability to learn things. It's not an institution in which you should just think, okay, I'm going to memorize and reiterate that. A monkey can do that. Learning things is about reading something, realizing what's written between the lines, what, and then realizing what's not in the text. Realizing what was specifically left out of the story and questioning why questioning things that seem perfectly logical to you. And I think at that point, you really start to learn. You start to cross-reference information. You start to dig deeper than what's just on the surface. I think from my career, when I started actually making hip-hop music, it was based on this battle style that I had acquired while I was incarcerated, and also the need and the necessity to express what was really going on in my world, in my life, and in people's lives around me. And that created the music that I make. I made the first record of mine, Revolutionary Volume 1, out of what I had written while I was incarcerated. And I found people that were willing to support me, 44 caliber, my brother Southpaw, a group of people called Wax Poetic, back in New York. And basically, I worked any job that I possibly could. And we joked about this in the meet and greet before when people said to me, oh, you know, people go to college and what's your criticism of a learning institution? And I said that there are two sides to it. There's a side of personal responsibility and then there's a side of coming here and feeling like for the first two years that you're in 13th and 14th grade. Oh, Lights go on. Man, I guess they didn't like that one too. <laughs> but the reality is that at some point, you say to yourself, you come here and you have an idea, or some of you may have a vision about what you want to do with your life. And you say, well, why am I taking these math and science courses that I took while I was in high school again? Shouldn't I be able to apply myself? And shouldn't you trust me enough now that I'm living on my own? Now that I can fight and die for my country? Now that I can buy cigarettes and give myself cancer and I have to bear that responsibility too? It, can I also have the responsibility to learn whatever it is I want to learn right now because I have a focus in life? And for those of you that don't have a focus, I, I tell people all the time, you know, if my kid came to me and I sent him to college and I was paying $40,000 a year for him to go to school or however much it is here, and he comes, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, man. Really? Okay. Well, I'm going to send you down to Arizona. 
and you're going to wake up at 4.30 in the morning and pick strawberries and you can go to sleep at 11 o'clock at night. And I guarantee you, after a month of doing that shit and waking up with blisters all over your hands and being delirious because of sleep and work deprivation, you're not going to come to me with this type of bullshit and you're going to know what you want to do with your life. Or I'm going to send you to the poorest, brokest white community in the Appalachians and you're going to flip burgers on some shithole joint by the side of the highway and see some of the most dilapidated and broken down communities. And I guarantee when you come out of there, you're going to know what you want to do with your life. And I don't have to hear this crap. So there are several things to be said about education, about the justice system. There are issues that are wrong with it. There are things that need to be reformed. And then, of course, there are a lot of personal responsibility that we need to take as a community, that you need to take as an individual for the choices that you make in life. I'm going to explain a little bit more about the music industry and what I began to deal with and the business of it that forced me to become even more revolutionary. And then I would definitely like to make some time at the end of this to take some questions from the audience. I think we're going to have some shirts set up outside and someone wants some t-shirts or something like that. But um, important to me to point out is that some people don't realize what it is in the music industry. And they don't even know what a record deal really is. And when I tell them this, some people in the music industry actually get offended. And they get offended because they know that I'm speaking the truth. That a record deal is unfortunately simply a loan with terrible interest rates where you don't even get to keep the property. Let's say you take out a loan for a house. Horrible interest rate. You get stuck with 18%. They're, they're shafting you. But you pay it all off. You own that property afterwards. You may have to pay property taxes for it, but it's yours. The person who loans you the money can't just come and say, oh, no, no, that's mine now. No, you got paid off. Get out of my life. Don't call me anymore. You're done for the night. Goodbye. But that's not the way it is in hip hop or in any other sorts of recorded music usually. Unless you have so many platinum albums under your belt that at some point you make up the laws and you have enough leverage to dictate the terms for yourself. When people come into the game fresh, usually the record uh, company takes all of their publishing, all of their masters, and by masters, I mean they own the rights to every single aspect of your music. Let's say this young man here writes a song, and now it's used in a Mazda commercial. Now, that company would have had to pay the record company thousands of dollars, and also publishing rights for every time that that commercial appears anywhere. But when you don't own your masters, brother, they take your money, and they use it for whatever they want. They can even use it for something that you may not like. Let's say there's a candidate that wants to play your song. You don't agree with the politics of this individual. Be they right wing or left wing, it doesn't matter. The point is that they have the ownership to your intellectual property. <coughs> and when I realized that that's how the game was set up, it kind of forced me into this mentality of thinking, well, now the only way to really have true sovereignty, true artistic freedom, is to be independent. Am I going to suffer and struggle for that? Absolutely. Is it worth it to have that independence? Yes. It's the difference in between saying, you know, would you like to have cable TV and HBO in a jail cell? Or would you like to have no TV and be able to be free? The basic, <laughs> tiny, pathetic luxury of life versus true freedom. When I step back from that, we'll get to this volume one situation. I worked any job that I possibly could to be able to afford to put it out. As a matter of fact, I even pretended I didn't speak English and I worked in a sweatshop for two or three weeks just to get over the edge of money that I needed to in order to make that quota to pay the pressing plan for the first 32 to 3300 copies of Revolutionary Volume 1 that came out. Now, seeing that opened my eyes to even a more dramatic quote-unquote immigrant experience for the Haitians and the Southeast Asian workers that were living in virtual serfdom in New York City, a city that I had lived in for literally a quarter of a century, and yet my eyes was just being opened, my eyes were just being opened up to their painful struggle that was even worse to what I had experienced growing up, or any person of color that grew up in the projects of Section 8 or grew up in a two-parent household such as myself could have possibly experienced. 
I had seen that when I went back to visit them and went to visit the third world, but until I saw it there, it's very telling.